Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead, and today I have the distinct pleasure to introduce you to the Wildlife Department's brand new director, J.D. Strong. Thanks for joining me today, J.D. Thanks for having me. You know, um, it's, it's kind of fun sitting here with you all these years later because J.D. and I were classmates in college, and now we're working together. <laughs> exactly. What a thrill. Who would have thought 20 years ago that we would be uh, back at it and, and doing what we love to do? Absolutely. I know a few professionals professors that are definitely surprised. <laughs> yeah, both of us. I'm sure that I ever <laughs> even made it through, yes. <laughs> hey, uh, you, uh, I've known you all for a long time, but tell folks a little bit about your background. Okay, well, I'm a fifth generation Oklahoman. I grew up in, in Weatherford, western Oklahoma. Uh, I, uh, you know, did a lot of hunting and fishing growing up and, and, and developed a passion then, uh, particularly thanks to my great grandpa for uh, fish and wildlife and, and the great outdoors and then um, went to school at Oklahoma State University got my degree in wildlife ecology and and that's of course where we met and had several classes together there mm -hmm. uh, and then um, from there ended up starting a, to work at the Oklahoma Water Resources Board at the time Department of Wildlife wasn't hiring even though that's where I wanted to be um, <laughs> 23 years ago uh, so ended up at the Oklahoma Water Resources Board uh, doing a lot of field sampling for them uh, water sampling by biological sampling for a couple of years and then ended up sort of moving more into the public uh, relations and legislative uh, policy world while I was there. Went through uh, several years working at the Secretary of Environment's office, became Secretary of Environment for a couple of years, uh, landed the executive director job at the Oklahoma Water Resources Board, which was a thrill, great agency, uh, loved all the great work that they did. Uh, but then, uh, lo and behold, when the Director of Department of Wildlife job came open uh, this past summer, mm -hmm. I definitely had to pounce on it. I thought it was probably my one last shot at getting to the agency I wanted to be at all along. So, Well, we're awfully glad that you you finally made it where you always wanted to be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one thing that we we pride ourselves at the Wildlife Department is is being founded on, on science. Most All of our major management decisions are founded on on science and and today it's a treat to have you here at Cookson Wildlife Management Area where we're actually doing some biological sampling exactly and uh, and and this kind of is right up your alley it is right up my alley I forgot uh, a lot of stuff I learned in college so I had to knock a lot of rust off today but <laughs> uh, it has been fun getting out doing some sampling with uh, some of our biologists out here on Cookson and um, and really seeing some fascinating things that are going on here in terms of wildlife management but also wildlife diversity this is a beautiful property and uh, for those that uh, live in Oklahoma that haven't been out here to take advantage of that they definitely should get out of here absolutely what let's there are a bunch of salamander species here. This is one of the areas of highest salamander diversity in the state. So in addition to the cave salamander, the Oklahoma salamander, and the dark side salamander, we have two species in the genus Plethodon. This is a western slimy salamander. It would be a young adult. Yeah. Uh, this is one, the, the Plethodon salamanders, like the slimy and the Ozark zigzag, don't have an aquatic stage. Terrestrial they, adult. Yeah, they have, a, they have terrestrial eggs, and they go through that larval stage in the egg, and they hatch out as miniature adults. Oh yeah, here's a an isopod. Our isopod. Okay, and I don't know like about that. isopods. Yes, yes, and those are aquatic. It's an aquatic isopod. It lives in these interstitial spaces. It is you know, the lowest. I guess it. They're sort of the. Uh, the, the tritivores of this these stream systems. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's Ozark zigzag. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's even better. That is another endemic one. That's that is the other uh, one that lays its eggs on land. It's uh, it's related to the slimy salamander. But that's an Ozark zigzag salamander. Wow. And I've only seen these are a lot less common than uh, yes in the, the Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. That's a salamander that's found again just in the Ozark. So just Oklahoma, Missouri, and Arkansas. Ozark zigzag. Huh? Ozark zigzag. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
We're out here today conducting surveys on some of the less common species that occur in Oklahoma, uh, just to try to improve our understanding of their habitat needs, uh, their distribution, and their status in the state. Great. That is the leopard frog. Leopard yeah. frog. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Leopard frog. Pickerels have the super yellow crotch. It's a little southern plains leopard, or southern leopard frog. I just never can. They're, they're tricky. Keep, well, I just can't keep the two names separated. Now, as more people have caught stuff, just like, nope. I'm pretty Everyone sure. Everyone around gonna, me is finding it. I'm gonna catch poison ivies, what I'm gonna catch. Well, there's <laughs> don't don't take any chances if you see something you think might be poison ivy, but I don't see any right through here. I was able to do quite a bit of this stuff the first couple of years I started with the Water Resources Board right out of college, sampling lakes and streams across the state and pulling a lot of water samples, but also doing biological sampling, which was everything from shocking fish in the lakes and streams seining, netting, gill netting, uh, but then we did a fair amount of uh, biomonitoring in streams looking at habitat, substrate, ripple pull run ratios, oh, and wow. all that good stuff. Dark side? Ah, we'll see, now we got a real dark side. We got two of them now. Okay. The dark side salamander is closely related to the Oklahoma salamander. It's what we call a stream or brook salamander. It, it, it stays close to water its entire life. Good luck finding them in March and April. They're actually a pretty common one. But then they go dormant during the, during the heat of the summer and during dry periods. Um, I'm kind of surprised that this one is out, uh, being as dry as it is, but I guess with the warm weather and being close to water here at the spring, he's, he, he or she's managed to stay active. But, and I don't, I'm not positive on the lifespan, but a lot of these salamanders will live seven to 10 years. Oh, so wow. fa fairly long lived yeah. for a small animal like that. Right. Well, since we have managed to find three salamanders good. that we didn't expect to see, the dark side salamander, the Ozark zigzag salamander, and the western slimy salamander, I'd say let's Head on, call this spot done and head on to another spot. We've chosen to work at Cookson Wildlife Management Area because of its location in the Ozarks. Uh, the Ozark region contains a number of salamanders and birds and fish that are found nowhere else. These are species that we call endemic because they're, they're just found here. Uh, one of these is the Oklahoma salamander, which is uh, a, a, a mostly nocturnal aquatic salamander that's thought to be very rare, and some people have actually petitioned it for listing as an endangered species. But the survey work that we've done and that others have done in recent years has shown that the Oklahoma salamander is actually pretty common and, and widespread within the Ozarks. Let's see if we have anything in here. We do, we do. There's. It's been trapped. I don't, the trip, trap has been tripped. I can't tell what's in here. I suspect it's a cotton rat, but we'll, we'll, we'll get him out. Swing it out. Oh, we've got something in here. I was getting like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> we got one in here. Somebody put a rattlesnake in this one. Yeah, looky there. Good. <laughs> That's what I'm after. I'm after whatever's, we're after whatever's here, but cotton red is kind of what you'd expect in this kind of habitat. But I think it's because we've had a series of mild, weather, mild winters, and then we had so much rain in 2015 that it's helped their food supply. So just like quail are up, cotton yeah. rats are up too. They bounce back fast. How's everybody getting back? Like I'm gonna... Do you wanna... <laughs> This, that's, it's harder than it looks, I think. You, you well, probably I'm, have a fine time. I haven't done it since college either, so are we ready? Good yeah. deal. Good job. We don't get a lot of voles in Oklahoma. We're on the kind of the western and southern edge of their range, but that's probably a woodland bowl. Get them out of there. You want to let the cotton rat go? Yeah. yeah. Just let, let the cotton rat go. <laughs> that is a big, I, I think it's a big ball. Curtis ball. has seen a lot more of them. Short stubby tail, it's a good characteristic, small eyes, small ears, yep. very nice. 
pretty sure that's a wooden. You just dump it out. I was gonna yeah. say, <laughs> nah, we don't need to get that one out. I bet I saw four or five dead coyotes on the side of the road just driving from Enid. This, this, is, this, this trap line's not working so well for me. Sparser here than it was on that, on that far edge. Yeah. And it, Another cotton rat. Um, white footed mouse. Nice. White footed mouse. The deer mouse. Yeah. You know, I, I'm real pleased that we've got three different species. Um, you know, through these traps, we we we've had we set out at this location 28 traps, and we had four captures, so that's 15% success rate, uh, which is which is about average. It's about right. That's some good diversity. And we got three species. I've got four rodents and three different species. We have woodland vole, two cotton rats, and a white-footed mouse. You know, JD, we're on Cookson today, but um, there are so many great wildlife management areas all over the state. There are, there's no question. This is, of course, the most eco-diverse state mile per mile of any state in the country. And I think the Department of Wildlife has done a great job over the past number of years acquiring lands that really well represent that eco-diversity that we have across the state, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the uplands in the Panhandle, uh, the short grass prairies in western Oklahoma, all the way to the, the swampy knees of southeast Oklahoma and here in the, the Ozarks at, at Cookson. So it's a great uh, snapshot or sampling of the ecodiversity that we have in this state. And it also provides our uh, Oklahomans with a great opportunity to get out and experience the, uh, the great outdoors, whether they like to hunt or fish, or whether they like to just hike and, and go bird watching and that sort of thing. And so our 3.6 million customers in this state don't all have the opportunity to own their own land. And so these wildlife management areas give them a great opportunity to go and experience all the great things that, uh, that our rich eco uh, diversity uh, and ecosystems have to offer across this state. You know, that's, that's great. Uh, and one thing that many times um, kind of eludes people is that you said, you know, we own these and, and the wildlife department holds the deeds on these properties and they're not going anywhere. Correct. So these will be held in the public trust and open for the public for, for you know, for the foreseeable future forever, really. Exactly, that's a, also a very important aspect of these WMAs, the fact that uh, we acquire them and they're not just for our enjoyment, but for the enjoyment of our children, grandchildren, and future generations of Oklahomans. You know, uh, you you have worked with folks in the wildlife department for a few years, but, but you've been an outsider until now. What did you see about the wildlife department that uh, attracted you to our agency? What did we have some some redeeming qualities that you saw? <laughs> Certainly, yeah, I wouldn't have been attracted to the job at all if if you didn't have redeeming <laughs> qualities. But yeah, I think uh, the number of years that I've had the opportunity to work pretty closely with the Department of Wildlife, it's been really evident that uh, people really like their job. They're passionate about their job. Uh, they love the great outdoors and developing better and better hunting and fishing and outdoor opportunities for Oklahomans, but they're also very passionate about uh, public service and all of those things are extremely important to me and, and I think something that I certainly saw from the outside in the employees of the Department of Wildlife. Well, that's great. And, and now that you've got really a, a month or two under your belt with us, do you see the agency any differently that now you're kind of in the inside? No, I think, um, if anything, it has certainly confirmed what I thought um, from the outside looking in. Uh, I was not shocked uh, in a negative way at all, but very positive uh, getting to know the people. Uh, I've been from now from southeast Oklahoma to western, northwestern, and here we are in northeastern Oklahoma just in the, the uh, month or so that I've been here so far. And, and everybody that I've had the opportunity to, to meet and work alongside uh, has proven time and time again that they love their job, they love what they do. There's a, there's a reason Department of Wildlife has the most tenured employees in all of state government and it's because people really love what they do and they love uh, getting to interact with Oklahomans on a, on a very ground level uh, each and every day as part of their jobs. Glad to have you out here on Cookson today. 
Thanks uh, for having me. This Cookson Wildlife Management Area is about uh, 15,000 acres, and uh, it's uh, dominated by an oak hickory forest. I've been here uh, about six years, and one of the big things that uh, we've tried to do out here is really ramp up our controlled burning on this management area. Great. So uh, we're, we have most of our burn units in a three-year burn rotation, and they've all received at least two fires through them in those six years. And just with those two fires, we've really already been able to see some great changes of increased forb and grass production out here, and uh, which is obviously beneficial for deer, turkey, uh, all kinds of wildlife. Yeah. How many units do you have it divided into? Uh, burn units, there's probably about 16. Some of them are as large as 1,300 acres, and some of them are as small as about 100. Okay. And the area is uh, open for archery hunting up until muzzleloader season. And then muzzleloader through gun season, we're closed down and we have some controlled hunts at that time. Uh, have controlled hunts for youth specifically and uh, disability hunt. And then we have a couple of muzzleloader and rifle hunts as well. And then after gun season gets over with, we'll open back up for uh, deer archery again. And at that time, we'll also open back up for all kinds of small game hunting as well. Wow. So, what a great treasure in Northeast Oklahoma for our uh, hunters to be able to get out and take advantage of. It is. I'm pretty partial to the area, but it's a, an absolutely beautiful place to yeah, be I can out see at. why. Where we're at right now is actually another management area technique or management technique uh, that we've utilized on the area. Um, one of the problems with the oak hickory forest in eastern Oklahoma is that without fire being in it for so long off the landscape, uh, the canopy has really closed in tightly and it shaded out all of those grasses and forbs that used to natively be out here on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you kind of look behind us and to the north here, you can see that we've got a whole lot of uh, leaf litter on the ground and a few sugar maple sprouts and some other woody sprouts. And that's about it. There's not hardly any uh, forbs or grasses out there and if it's late February you know January or February and you're a deer and it's a bad acorn year and you're walking around in that we've got some browse uh, but there's not a whole lot to eat out there right not a lot of forage right and so uh, if you look over here to our south you can see we've done a hack and squirt herbicide treatment out here and the whole concept behind it is to selectively get rid of some trees and open up that canopy. You can see some large areas of uh, open canopy up there. Mm -hmm. That allows that sunlight to hit the ground floor and uh, really increases the grasses and forbs that we have out here. And, and so uh, wildlife just, just love it. So these will be the uh, little pockets that really attract the wildlife that are on the uh, WMA, I would assume. That's what we're hoping. And the nice thing about the hack and squirt herbicide treatment is that you can be very specific in your prescription. It's almost like a prescribed burn. You can write up a prescription and be very selective on what species you want to target and even the size classes. This unit, we targeted uh, all species, but we limited it to anything three to 10 inch diameter at breast height. So we wanted to leave our big, you know, mature oak trees. So do you have a particular pattern to it? Do you try to do strips or more square patches or is it more species dependent? When we first got into it we were just trying to see how it would work. We got a, a good add-on and so we were a little bit random in what we chose but we were kind of looking for upland sites because historically uh, this area would have been um, almost an oak hickory savanna. Uh, you know, lots and lots of grasses and forbs up top on the ridges, and then the draws would have been heavily timbered. Mm -hmm. And so we've tried to kind of hit the, the top sites. We've got some other units that have several uh, ridges, little fingers running through them, and so we would only work those ridge tops and leave the draws uh, completely alone. Interesting. And then it ends up uh, uh, speeding up the burn process. I mean, the whole reason that we're doing controlled burns is to uh, reduce some of that woody cover and, uh, and grass, stimulate the undergrowth at the same the time, right? And yeah. those grasses and forbs that are there that are already 
fire tolerant, they also carry fire extremely well. So we get hotter fires that move through uh, these burnt or these hack and square units. Looks like you guys are doing some great and fairly new uh, innovative wild uh, techniques out here to enhance the uh, wildlife population. Well, JD, what uh, might be some of your more immediate priorities that you think you might want to tackle? Well, I think first and foremost, it's important to note that, you know, everything is, I think, going great, smoothly, well done, well run ship at Department of Wildlife. So I have no ambitions to come in and shake things up and make big changes. But certainly as I've talked to folks on staff at the Department of Wildlife, there are constantly things that need to be done to better improve outdoor experiences. And, and so there are things like, you know, getting, making sure that we stay up in this digital age with uh, some of the, the new techniques that are out there to be able to better track what our our customers, our hunters and fishermen and outdoor enthusiasts are truly interested in uh, and making sure that we are there to help serve and meet those needs, whether it's uh, getting better databases online to be able to, to track what licenses and permits and tags everyone is buying, that sort of thing. So I think that's something that's important to try to tackle uh, right off the bat. And there are probably a couple of other things on the list up <laughs> on the short term, but that's certainly one of them. Well, if you could uh, look into your magic ball in the future, uh, are there some even bigger, loftier things that you want to tackle during your time with us? Well, I think certainly looking out uh, on the horizon, uh, one of our big challenges and probably a challenge for wildlife departments uh, nationwide will be this more and more urbanized society that we see. We see a lot of people in our state um, migrating from those rural areas to the urban areas and they have less and less experience in the outdoors. There's less and less interest in hunting and fishing and even just getting out and taking a hike. Um, and so I think our great challenge is gonna be to make sure we keep people plugged in and keep them interested in getting out and seeing all the, the beautiful uh, nature and, and hunting and fishing experiences that Oklahoma has to offer and making sure that they continue to engage in those activities. And, and so that's certainly gonna be a huge challenge for us, but one that I think uh, with the great staff we have at Department of Wildlife, mm -hmm. we'll be able to tackle head on. That's great. Well, you know, uh, I know that your future holds a lot of time in meetings and in the office, and I don't want to keep you from <laughs> having some fun today out here at Cookson. Right. And I know the guys are getting ready to move upstream, so I sure appreciate you taking some time with me today. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to get back out there and sample. All righty. Thank you. Take care. Hey, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Thank you.